The student address will be presented by Jacob R. Romero of the class of 2009. I love you too. It's all right. All right, friends and family, class of 2009, uh, good afternoon. My name is Jake Romero, and I'm not your valedictorian. In thinking about the credentials to be up here speaking today, I was reminded that when I received my undergraduate degree, the commencement speaker at the time, uh, his sole claim to fame was that he played some guy named Carlos on Desperate Housewives. Uh, but I lack even this credential. So yes, I'm something of an atypical commencement speaker. But these are atypical times that we're graduating into. And so what I'd like to talk about is something a little bit different. You know, it's been nearly three years since we stepped onto this campus for orientation. And at the time, we were told almost immediately and have been told many times since that we're here in law school to learn how to think like a lawyer. And if you live to be a thousand years old, will that ever really make any sense? I mean, in a quantifiable way that you can make a goal out of it. I mean, sure, we have a vague idea of what it means to think like a lawyer, but I know exponentially more attorneys now than I did when I started, and they just seem like a very differentiated bunch to me. With attorneys helping out in our community in hundreds of different ways, how is it possible that they all think alike? And yet, in preparation for today, I've been thinking about this phrase a lot. And I think that I may have been given the answer to this during the summer after my second year. At the time, I was a summer associate at a law firm here in San Diego. And, uh, you know, as a summer associate, your only real job is to just be pleasant enough to go to lunch with. Um, but every now and then, an assignment comes along to test your ability to not run screaming from the building. It was after this kind of assignment that I was receiving feedback from the attorney who said, Jake, more than half of what it means to be a great attorney is to learn how to fly by the seat of your pants. And I stopped a second. Flying by the seat of your pants, what does that even mean? So I went to the place I always go when I'm looking for meaning in life, the dictionary, which defines it as to do something difficult without the necessary experience or ability. And since we're in the process of defining, let's use it in a sentence, because that always helps. I don't know much about time travel, but ever since I got this DeLorean up to 88 miles per hour, I've had to fly by the seat of my pants. <laughs> I submit to you the notion that this quality being comfortable while flying by the seat of your pants is precisely what it means to think like a lawyer. You see, the qualities that this requires are ones that I believe to be common elements among attorneys of all kinds, and specifically, I believe there are five of them. The first, being comfortable with what you cannot change. Flying by the seat of your pants is the action of testing the outer limits of your own abilities. It is being willing to engage in the process of exploring a possibility to learn something new. One cannot do this, however, by focusing entirely on what knowledge or skill is missing. As such, it requires a sense of when to let go and when to keep fighting. I believe this skill is developed in part through the natural process of getting older as we tend to become more comfortable working within the bounds of our own power to change the universe. You know, I was the kid that drank Tang all the time because I was sure that I was going to be an astronaut. Uh, no other you know, career outcome was likely. It was never going to happen any other way. So when I was between 2 and 12, this was my plan, and I stuck to it. Uh, the only change came during my early teens when I decided I would eventually develop superpowers of some kind, so I had to update the plan, but that didn't require that I scrap it entirely. I needed answers for everything, and even in preschool I was concerned about you know, my daily plan. On weekends I was upset that my daily routine of uh, sodium-free wheat thins and naps was disrupted. And this type of behavior may seem odd for a child, but it's consistent with the notion that many children have of the sort of limitless expectation of, of their own place in life and in this universe. We're three years older than when this all began, but it often feels like more. I know that when I look in the mirror, it certainly looks like more. And that probably is true for most of us, but since we're, we've learned that there's exceptions to every rule, I'd like to point out that my good friend Ed Newlands, who's graduating with us today, he still gets carded when he tries to buy a ticket for an R-rated movie. <laughs> but just as time has taken its toll disproportionately, we've also matured to a greater degree over these three years. Before law school, it was a struggle for me merely to come to terms with the fact that I'll never be able to grow a Tom Selleck mustache. But for the better part of three years, we've been required to make far-reaching decisions about our futures under the most trying circumstances, often with limited information and little or no room for error. In a down economy, many of us find ourselves without a plan. Much of this is due to circumstances we cannot change. These are frustrating times, but it's precisely at times like these that this skill is most essential. Being comfortable without a plan, 
and knowing what you cannot change means that you are willing to go forward without the plan, to know that there are an infinite number of ways for you to be you, the strength to say, this is who I am, this is what I'm working toward, and though I cannot achieve it all at once, this is how I'm going to measure my success until I get there.